Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. It's time for our monthly Q&A. Before we get on with the questions, let's first get high on tea. This week's tea is Tie Guan Yin, a famous tea from the Wulong Tea family, native to Anxi in Fujian province. In terms of classification, Tie Guan Yin lies between green tea and red tea. Very often, people categorize this as a Qing Cha or dark green tea. Tie Guan Yin is one of the top 10 teas in China due to its history, flavor, and health benefits. Written records show that Wulong tea, including the Tie Guan Yin, was invented around 1725 to 1735 in Anxi and later many areas such as Guangdong and Taiwan also started growing and producing Tie Guan Yin. There are three types of Tie Guan Yin in terms of their flavor. Light fragrance, strong fragrance, and aged fragrance Tie Guan Yin. Each with a unique experience. There exist many origin stories behind the name Tie Guan Yin, the most popular one being that Qianlong, a Qing Dynasty Emperor, was the one who coined it. Fang Bao, a very prominent scholar and literature in the Qing Dynasty, received this tea as a gift from his friend Wang Shirang. Fang Bao realized that this tea was so good and he presented it to Qianlong, the Qing Emperor. Qianlong tasted it and noticed the strong and unique fragrance of this tea. So, he gave it the name Tie Guan Yin. The name Tie Guan Yin consists of three characters. Tie means iron, due to the strong dark color and heavy appearance of its leaves. Tie also means strong in Chinese. Guan Yin, commonly known as the goddess of mercy, is a highly respected figure in many Asian cultures. The name Guan Yin literally means observing the sound or Christ of the world. So, Qianlong used the term Tie Guan Yin or Anren Goddess of Mercy to express the great flavor of this tea. Originally, Tie Guan Yin was the name of that species tree. Later on, any tea precise with the Tie Guan Yin method came to be classified as a Tie Guan Yin tea. I like Tie Guan Yin from both Fujian and Taiwan, especially the Taiwanese Tie Guan Yin is my favorite tea. The basic fragrance of Tie Guan Yin is the orchid and can have more varieties depending on other factors such as processing method and the origin of the tea leaves. To prove Tie Guan Yin, the water temperature should be between 95 and 100 degrees Celsius, depending on the type of tea determined by its fermentation level and type of fragrance. However, some people prefer to use 90 degree water to brew light colored Tie Guan Yin or green Guan Yin. My recommendation is to first add Tie Guan Yin to a teapot, then add water and uh, let it brew for about 1 minute for the first brew. For subsequent brews, the brewing time should be a bit longer in order to extract the great flavor out of the leaves. Usually, the color of Tie Guan Yin decoction is orange-yellow. Some varieties can provide a dark yellow color depending on the processing method. This tea is a light fragrance Tie Guan Yin tea. The 
big tea leaf is very beautiful. The health benefit of Tie Guan Yin include improving skin health, weight loss, and refreshing the mind. However, Tie Guan Yin tends to have a higher percentage of caffeine, so you may want to avoid drinking it in the evening lest it cause sleeping issues. I can bore you to death on the topic of Tie Guan Yin since I like this tea a lot but in the interest of time, I will save it for later. Do let me know your experiences with Tie Guan Yin in the comments. I hope you enjoy Tie Guan Yin tea. Now, let's take a quick look at the question for today. First, from uh, um, Bailey J, Tea Brewing. Second, from Lauren Stacy Ba Bao Cha. Third, from Sunken City Games, Tan Tui. Fourth, from Alien, Combining All Three Internal Cells. Fifth, from Tai Chi, Tai Chi Quan, Tai Chi Stepping. Sixth, from Ian Barker, Tai Chi Differences in Stance Width. Seventh, from Darkwing Dog. First, Learn Leaning and Straightness. Eighth from Darkwing Dog, Hu Lei Jia Tai Ji. Ninth from Darkwing Dog, Frames in Bagua and Xing Yi. Tenth from Darkwing Dog, Other Chinese Martial Arts. Eleventh from Bei Feng Dao Ren, Ego Grasping in Xing Yi. Bailey J asks about the three second brewing method for Feng Huang Dan Chong that I mentioned a few videos ago. Thank you, Bailey J. I'm very happy to see that quite a few community members, including yourself, paid attention to this detail. So, I'd like to answer this question and also demonstrate how to brew the tea in 3 seconds. The brewing time is counted from the moment after the water has been added to the tea pot or cup until you start to pour the tea out or enjoy it directly. So, 3 seconds of brewing time means that you wait for 3 seconds after adding water into the cup. Now, let me demonstrate it to you. Again, I use the Gai Wan or covering cup instead of a teapot since a teapot is much easier to handle while Gai Wan needs some practice. Okay, now let me demonstrate the 3 second tea brewing method. So, you add the tea leaf in the tea cup, then add water. <coughs> After <coughs> this, wait for 3 seconds. 1, 2, 3. Then, pour this out. That is the 3 second tea brewing method. Hope that answers the question, Bailey. Let's move on to the next question. Okay. Lawrence Stacy asked about Ba Bao Cha or Eight Treasures Tea. Thank you, Lawrence, for this question. Ba means eight, Bao means treasure, indicating different ingredients, and Cha means tea. It is a kind of tea beverage or Cha Yin Liao. By adding many different ingredients into tea. This is why it is the tea beverage, since in China, when we talk about the tea, it only means a drink that only uses leaves of a Camilla senescence. So, there's a big difference between tea and tea beverages. Now, let's talk about Ba Bao Cha, a popular Cha Yin Liao or tea beverage in China. Actually, the word 8 in this name, 8 treasures tea, does not mean that there are only 8 ingredients added to the tea. The number can be more or less depending on personal preference. Also, different areas in China prefer to use different ingredients. For example, in Northwest China, People prefer to add sugar, raisins, 
呃 Dragon Eye or Democapus Logan dates, chrysanthemums and so on into the tea. In Sichuan, people prefer adding a licorice, wolfberry, dates, raisins, chrysanthemums, and others into jasmine tea. Starting a few decades ago, more and more flowers have been added to tea, leading to the creation of an increasing number of eight treasures tea variations. Also, many people in China believe ingredients such as rose buds to be good for the skin, thus making eight treasures tea attractive to female consumers. I have tried the bubble cha a few times at my friends' homes. I do not prepare this type of tea beverage at home since I prefer pure tea. Since the taste and the flavor of Ba Bao Cha mainly depends on other ingredients inside of the tea itself, you can make a different type of Ba Bao Cha according to your own preference. Furthermore, Ba Bao Cha may provide more health benefits since different added ingredients can strengthen the health benefits compared to the tea leaves alone. I hope that answers the question, Lawrence. Let's move on to the next one. Sunken City Games ask about Tan Tui and its relevance in Chinese martial art, including Shaolin, Cha Quan, and also why the internal styles doesn't include it. Thank you, Sunken City Games. This is a great question. Before we go any further, let's first clarify the term Tan Tui. Tan Tui can actually mean two different terms in martial art practice. The first is a basic martial art kicking training, which is Tan Tui. Here, Tan means kicking, and Tui means leg techniques. The second Tan Tui is the name of a martial art style, a great style with about a thousand years worth of history. The Chinese writing for the second Tan Tui can be both Tan Tui and Tan Tui. People use the latter form more often for the martial art style. Given its long history, it has influenced many styles. There's also quite some overlap in the practice of Tan Tui and many other styles, such as Cha Quan, which you mentioned in your question. By the way, I have briefly introduced the Tan Tui style in a prior video titled Decoding Martial Proverbs Series 3. In that video, I explained a martial proverb Nan Quan Bei Tui, or Southern Fist and Northern Leg. Let's replay that part first. Around the same time, another famous martial general who later became a monk created a famous style of martial art. His name was Kun Lun, a religious name after he became a monk. The historical reason for a military general becoming a monk was that he lost in the war between the Song Dynasty and the later Zhou Dynasty. With his 200 surviving soldiers, he fled to Shandong Province. Shandong Province is the big region in the north of China. The famous Tai Mountain is in this province. With his soldiers, he settled in a temple called Long Tan Si or Dragon Lake Temple in Linqing, a small town in Shandong Province. By the way, in 1964, the government cut Linqing into two parts, one part belonging to Shandong and the other belonging to Hebei Province. Today, the temple is part of Hebei, Hebei Province, but originally it was in Shandong Province. So, in order to preserve and propagate his practice, Kun Lun taught his students in Longquan Temple. His style mainly focused on Tui Gong. Now, I have to explain 
what to go is. In my prior video, I talked about the martial proverb, Lian Wu Bu Lian Gong, Gao Lao Yi Chang Gong. All techniques without basics are hollow. Tui means leg, Gong means basics. Together, Tui Gong means training focused on leg basics. Be careful, Tui Gong or leg basics is different from leg techniques or leg skill. In that style, they emphasize on Tui Gong or leg basics since they believe that the martial power is from the leg, then moves to the hips, and then move to the arm and hand. So, any attack on the arm and hand should be generated by leg and transferred by the hips. This is the meaning of Tui Gong or leg basics. It is not about kicking, knee attack, or whatever related to any specific leg techniques or skill. It is a principle, not a technique. So, the leg basics from the Long Tan Temple are called Tan Tui. Tan is, the, is from the second word of the name of the temple, Long Tan Temple, or Dragon Lake Temple. And Tui means leg, or leg basics. Together, the full translation is Dragon Lake Temple Leg Basics. There are 10 small routines of this style. In the Ming Dynasty, there was a very important military document called Wu Bei Zhi, or Records of Armament and Military Provisions. This book is the most comprehensive military book in Chinese history. It was compiled by Mao Yuanyi in 1621, according to the famous military training documents. This is a huge book containing 240 volumes and has 10,405 pages. In Wu Bei Zhi, it records that in the beginning of the Song Dynasty, the Song Emperor Zhao Kuangyin organized a martial event in Changsha, a province of China. In this event, 18 styles of martial arts were re recognized and ranked according to their efficiency and popularity. Of course, the style created by the Emperor himself the Tai Zu Changquan, or the Long Fist, was ranked as the number one. Then, the number two style was the Tan Tui, the style created by monk Kunlun in the temple in Shandong. In ancient Chinese culture, the south direction has been considered number one, while the north has been considered number two, is called North according to the five elements and the five direction concept. Let me be clear, the numbers are just an order of, of specification. They do not signify any preferences or importance over one another. Therefore, the Emperor's style is in the south direction and the Tan Tui is in the north direction. So, the long fist is the south and the Tan Tui is the north. Or, the south direction is the fist and the north direction is the leg. From then on, people started using Nan Quan Bei Tui or south fist and the north leg to indicate long fist and Tan Tui or Nan Quan Bei Tui. Furthermore, originally, there were 10 small routines in Tan Tui. Now, after centuries of development, this style has more than 30 routines, and there are about 50 weapons forms. Also, there are different branches of this style as well, including Muslim, Shaolin, and Jing Wu styles. Jing Wu style was created by Huo Yuanjia in Tianjin. By the way, there are 12 routines in Shaolin style which was added two more routines based on the original style. 
So that was the replay briefly introducing the history of uh, Tan Tui. Now let's get back to your question about why the internal styles do not practice Tan Tui. Well, after watching that replay, it should not now be clear that any style, no matter internal or external, will include Tan Tui, the kicking techniques. However, if you mean Tan Tui, the independent martial style, and not just the kicking techniques alone, then it is not time efficient for internal style practitioners to focus on this content since well developed systems such as Xing Yi, Tai Chi, and Bagua have many movements and practices that provide similar benefits as Tan Tui, the martial art style. The multiple possible meanings of the term Tan Tui make it a bit confusing to some people in the community, but I hope my answer clarifies any such confusion. Again, thank you, Sunken City Games, for this great question. Let's move on to the next one. Alien asks why I don't combine all the three internal styles into one style. Thank you, Alien. Good question. This is actually not the first time I have been asked this question, but let me use this opportunity to publicly answer it. In the context of uh, Chinese martial arts, it has never been easy and still isn't easy to create a new traditional style, since any traditional style should have a theory, single movements, routine, weapons, and applications, among other aspects. In my opinion, in the last century, only one new style was created, Yi Quan, a style based on Xing Yi by Wang Xiangzhai. Other practices such as Lu Shi Jie Gou, Gui Ji Quan Xue, or even Jack Kun Do are just some training methods based on traditional systems, and not new styles if we follow the traditional standards. In the early days of Yi Quan, some people used to refer to Xing Yi Quan as Yi Quan, which led Wang Xiangzhai to call his style Yi Quan. Here, a new style means a totally new system, not a branch of the style such as the Hebei style of Xing Yi, or even a sub-style of a branch such as Xue Din style of Xing Yi, a sub-style of the Hebei branch of Xing Yi. Well, the idea of combining multiple styles into a single style might sound appealing in terms of reducing time investment for the same benefit. The reality is far too different. Our expectation might be that the new style would be better than all three individual styles, but in reality, this style would, in any likelihood, end up being a dysfunctional mutant. Every style has its own approach to different aspects of a martial art, and uh, combining them would most likely result in chaos. Even if you consider a style like Zhang Zhaodong's Xing Yi Ba Gua Pang, well, it surely is the modification of a Cheng style Ba Gua with a Xing Yi influence. It is not a replacement either for Cheng style Ba Gua or for Xing Yi. My responsibility is to transmit my knowledge to my students and uh, to present and uh, future generations. In order to do so, I have to respect the tradition and not mix different practice from different styles together. I'm working on improving different branches of uh, the three internal styles that I learned from different teachers, but those improvements cannot be considered the creation of uh, new styles. Some people in China said that I should name the Xing Yi I teach Hai Yang style Xing Yi. I prefer to not name the practices I teach after myself. Whatever future generations choose to do or not do is their call, not mine. 
As for my personal practice, well, of course, I do not limit myself to any style in practice at any given point in time nowadays. I practice whatever I think is necessary. I fluidly switch from one style to another in my daily practice. But that's only because I have spent a lot of time practicing each style in isolation. But my current approach to practice is only for myself. That is not what I use for teaching. Thank you once again for your question, Alien. This was a good opportunity for me to share my inner thoughts. Let's move on to the next question. Okay. Powell aka Tai Chi Tai Chi Chuan asked two stepped variations in Tai Chi. Feet sliding and scraping the ground versus feet directly planted in one spot with toes changing directions based on positions. Thank you, Powell. In many forward stepping movements in Chen style Tai Chi, if the angle between the calf and the thigh is more than 90 degrees, the movement actually is meant for kicking. For example, these posters. So, most of the kicking movements in Tai Chi use the heel. This is why the toes are slightly pushed backward in order to strengthen the heel's kick. With regard to the foot landing on the ground, there are two approaches as you mentioned in your question. The first is to put slightly slide the foot forward and the second is to plant the foot on the ground. Traditionally, when the heel reaches the ground, there is a very small sliding motion, which can be obvious or very subtle. Some practitioners emphasize the sliding motion and make it a separate movement in order to practice the strength and the flexibility of the body weight supporting leg or substantial leg. So, both approaches are correct. In practice, I always add a small sliding motion into my formal practice. I hope that answers your question, Powell. Take good care in Shanghai. Let's move on to the next question. Ian Barker asked about Tai Chi stance differences between form practice and combat situations. He says, quote, For someone who trains Chen style Tai Chi, the stance usually are very wide, sometimes even wider than shoulder width. When someone reaches an advanced level in Chen style where they are doing small circle Tai Chi for combat, are the stance still very wide or do they reduce to no more than hip width or even smaller? Thank you, Ian. This is a great question. First of all, there is no correlation between foot distance and the level of Tai Chi practice. Form practice emphasizes a lower stance in order to improve overall body flexibility and maintain a strong body structure. However, in combat situations, we usually adopt a natural stance, which means that the distance between the feet is a little wider than the shoulders and the hips. In other words, keeping the distance between the feet less than the, the width of the hips is not recommended unless the situation demands it. In Tai Chi practice, it is always advisable to practice a low stance in form training since it can help the practitioner improve Tai Chi skills more effectively and efficiently. However, this gets naturally more challenging as the practitioner advances in age. As a result, older Tai Chi practitioners tend to maintain a higher or more natural posture. However, many great Tai Chi masters manage to practice with a very low posture even in their senior age. A case in point is one of my own Tai Chi teacher, Ma Hong. Of course, 
there exist definite standards to judge the correctness of a lower posture. Low posture can be incorrect if it does not meet certain criteria. So, a correct Tai Chi stance practice is a lot more important than just maintaining a low posture. In other words, you should gradually lower your posture in practice in order to not sacrifice the quality of your practice. Start from a high yet correct posture and then gradually lower your posture. Also, this principle is applicable to all Tai Chi styles even though some Tai Chi styles have a different body structures and principles in dealing with very low stances used in the Chen style. Ian, I hope I have answered your question. Let's move on to the next one. Darkwing Dog asked a few questions which I will answer one by one. First, he asks if some postures that involve the spine bending outward, such as in Dai style Xin Yi Quan, follow the same principles as the leaning postures with the straight spine. Good question. Bending the spine in some martial postures is not considered leaning. It should fall into another category. Leaning or straightness is about the whole body structure, not only the upper back area. For example, a bending back structure can still be straight or leaning in general. Based on my experience, any movement becomes incorrect when overdone. So, bending motion in Dai style Xin Yi is not an extreme way of bending, or else it would be considered a mistake. Next, he asked Hu Lei Jia or Thunder Frame Tai Chi. I quote, Can you explain briefly about a Tai Chi style called Sudden Thunder Tai Chi or Hu Lei Jia Tai Chi? I read some people said it is a sub style for Chen style, while some said it is derived from Zhao Bao style, and there is some who said it should have its own category, and what is the challenge or difficulty in learning Hu Lei Jia Tai Chi, in your opinion? Hu Lei Jia or Thunder Frame Tai Chi was developed by Chen Qingping. In my Tai Chi introduction videos, I mentioned that originally, Chen style Tai Chi was a small frame Tai Chi. Chen Changxing modified the original Chen style small frame to Chen style big frame. Right now, the popular Tai Chi frame is the Chen style big frame due to promotional efforts made by prominent Tai Chi masters such as Chen Fa Ke, Chen Zhao Pi, Chen Zhao Kui, among others. So, <coughs> Chen Qingping, who lived from 1795 to 1868, created Hu Lei Jia based on Chen style small frame Tai Chi, integrated with other Tai Chi routines back then. People called it Hu Lei Jia due to the presence of many Faji movements in the form involving an audible sound in practice. The reason for the confusion in terms of classification of this style as a Chen style or Zhao Bao style is due to the background of Chen Qingping. People in Chen village believe his form to be from Chen style because he was originally from Chen village and he later moved to Zhao Bao town to get married. But people in Zhao Bao town believe that he studied Zhao Bao Tai Chi and created his own frame later. <clears throat> it is understandable that both Chen Village and Zhao Bao Tang would try to claim his practice as a part of their own since he was a great Tai Chi practitioner. By the way, Zhao Bao Tang and Chen Village cannot really be separated. The full name of Chen Village is Chen Village. Zhao Bao Tang, Wen County, Jiaozuo City, Henan Province. So, technically, 
you can say Chen Qingping was from Zhao Bao and Chen Village. In my opinion, Hu Lejia can be considered a Chen style small frame and Zhao Bao Tai Chi. And for practice, it can be a separate category altogether so that there won't be any argument. <clears throat> As for the challenge or difficulty in learning that frame, I don't think there's any special concern. It is just like any other Tai Chi style in terms of practice. Fa Jin is an inseparable part of Chen style Tai Chi, no matter whether big frame or small frame. Next, he asked about the existence of frames in Xing Yi and Ba Gua as in Tai Chi. He also asked about high, middle, and low stance practice for different skill levels. Any style of martial art will have variations in body structure on account of different heights of stances. Bagua and Xing Yi are no exception. However, in Xing Yi, the overall body structure utilizes a natural stance since Xing Yi is based on the Sun Ti stand, which is a forward and backward oriented stance, totally different from Tai Chi and Ba Gua stances. There are many low postures in Xing Yi practice as well, such as the swallow form, but overall, it is the style that focuses on a natural stance. However, in any practice, a natural stance or higher posture is typically recommended to a beginner, with a gradual progression into a lower posture with improvement in flexibility. With the advancement in the practitioner's age, a natural stance or higher posture is normally the only option for them. That is the result of the aging process and not a proactive decision made by the practitioner. Again, many great internal style masters are able to continue low stance practice well into their senior age due to regular and persistent practice in their younger years. Finally, he asked about any possible influence of uh, Mosaism or Mo Jia and Hanfei legalism or Fa Jia on any martial art styles, as well as the influence of Buddhism or on Shaolin and the influence of uh, Islam on Cha Quan and Ba Ji Quan. These are great questions. The study of philosophy has been a huge part of my life, and I have studied all of the philosophical schools you mentioned in your questions. In the interest of time, I'd like to give you a brief answer today and I will elaborate on this in de dedicated videos in the future. Yes, all of the internal styles are influenced by Taoism and Confucianism, which I have mentioned in prior videos already. In contrast, Mo Jia or Mosism and Fa Jia or Hanfei legalism have nothing to do with the martial art practice since they really focus on social and political discussions. Throughout Chinese history, martial art practice has been influenced by religious beliefs, which is a very interesting phenomenon. Think about this. All of the religion you mentioned, Taoism, Buddhism, and Islam, focuses on and promote similar qualities like peace, mercy, kindness, and compassion. However, Chinese martial artists integrated martial art practice with philosophical aspects provided by those religious teachings. Especially in the case of Taoism, Martial art practice and Taoism have mutually enriched each other. For example, throughout history, Taoist ideological theories have had a great theoretical impact on martial practice, and martial practice has been used to demonstrate 
Tao is the beliefs. With regards to Xiu Dao, the relationship between Xiu Dao practice and the development of the Taoism is really intertwined and closely integrated together. Another interesting phenomenon is that many martial art styles were historically developed and promoted based on different religious beliefs. Also, temples usually became the source of a style. For example, the Shaolin style was from Shaolin Temple, and so on. This is a really interesting phenomenon which I will talk about in the future. Thank you, Dark Green Dog. I hope I have answered your questions. Now, let's look at the final question for today. <coughs> Bei Feng Dao Ren asked about ego grasping in Xing Yi. He says, I quote, Someone from Singapore claims that it's the most essential practice. <coughs> Thank you for this great question. Yes, I have also heard about this claim. Shang style Xing Yi especially emphasizes this practice. Externally, it looks like a variation of Pichuan. Internally, it is the power releasing practice that focuses on Xing Yi's fighting principle. In Xing Yi, there exists the term Qi Zuan Luo Fan, or move upward with a drilling motion while moving downward with turning motion. And uh, Ying Zhuo really represents the Luo Fan, or turning motion in downward movement. <clears throat> As for its importance, of course, it is important. However, one single practice cannot represent the whole system. Ying Zhuo or ego grasping is only one of the essential Xing Yi practices. The most important Xing Yi practices are 5 elements, 12 animals, and 8 words, plus many others. Ying Zhuo, which represents Luo Fan, cannot even represent the entire Qi Zuan Luo Fan or bear and ego, which represents the Xing Yi practice. So, ego grasping alone cannot be considered the most essential practice. Emphasizing any single important aspect is right, but at the same time, over emphasizing that aspect at the expense of other important aspects is wrong. I hope that answers your question, Bei Feng Dao Ren. That brings us to the end of this month's Q&A. I hope you found my answers informative. As always, please do not hesitate to ask your follow-up questions or entire new questions. Thanks for watching. See you next time and enjoy your practice.